I would uh, like to introduce uh, uh, Isabella Rekokar <laughs> to uh, tell us more about all the PARP inhibitors that are now on, uh, in, in trials. Hi, everybody. Um, before to start my talk, I just want to know who have already treated patients with PARP inhibitor. Can you hand your hand? Oh, good. Good. Good point. We, we will have a, a, a good session. Um, so, I will go back to the, um, the mechanism of action. As you know, in, uh, particularly in tumor cells, we have very frequently DNA damage. And um, due to this DNA damage, we need to repair DNA with two different systems. The system I including a uh, single stable strap and the homologous recombination repair system. When you use a pop inhibitor, you uh, um, um, block the system of reparation for a single stand break. And so during the replication, next time, you induce a double strand break. And if you are in the configuration where your tumor cell is um, with a homologous recombination deficiency, at that time, you induce apoptosis and cell death. It is um, the uh, synthetic lethality, as it is mentioned in, uh, in all the um, publications. This is the major part of the PARP activity, but we know also that we have other mechanisms. I don't want to move more in detail, but we also have some PARP trapping and, and other and HEG inactivation able to explain the PARP inhibitor in a tumor cell lines. So now, looking at the different compounds available for us in ovarian cancer. The first one is Olaparib, approved in uh, Europe in maintenance treatment. All right, uh, it is a switch maintenance, but it is also a maintenance treatment as monotherapy. And it is also available for patients with BRCA mutation in monotherapy, but after three lines or uh, equal to three lines of treatment. Uh, all of the indication is dedicated to patients with BRCA-mutated ovarian cancer. The uh, second one is the Rucaparib, approved in US, not in Europe until now, in monotherapy for patients receiving two or more lines of chemotherapy in the sensitive or resistant group, and also uh, for patients where we have a BRCA mutation, uh, um, ovarian cancer. Then we will have niraparib. I don't want to develop so much niraparib because Keta will do it uh, after. And perhaps we will see also the velaparib uh, compound is uh, dedicated to first line, and we have currently a different uh, phase three trial uh, ongoing in U.S., in preclinical data, we have in vitro exploration to test the activity of all these compounds. And as you can see on the figure, they, uh, the majority of them focus on only two PARP, PARP1 and PARP2. It's really interesting to have a very uh, targeted uh, activity on some target. Why? Because we can imagine that we will decrease the toxicity of the drug. We just have to mention the thalazoparib, who are a little bit different from the other because the activity of the TNKS2 target, we are involved in the remodeling of the telomere. But all the others seem quite similar, specifically dedicated to PARP1 and PARP2. In terms of clinical activity, I don't want to go back more in detail to all these uh, clinical trial because the majority uh, of you are well known by now. But what I would like to focus is about the uh, activity in terms of response rate and in the population. You know, I, I remember you that Olaparib show significant activity to be labeled for maintenance treatment after response to platinum in recurrent setting for BRCA mutated and also upfront therapy for BRCA mutated patients after three lines of treatment. But when you are looking to this water plot activity, we will see very well that, of course, the PARP is clearly efficient in BRCA mutated ovarian cancer, but also in non-BRCA, specifically in the group of patients reporting sensitivity to platinum. So we know now that the PARP 
inhibitor is not only dedicated to BRCA. And it is one of the major issues we have to resolve today. In terms of activity for Recaparib, this was reported in a big phase two where we explore the activity also for BRCA mutated patients, but in front line, we are not in maintenance, but also in the group of patients considered as to be BRCA light. We will come back later. And also in the group of patients where there is no BRCA mutation, but also no HRD um, uh, in the uh, somatic analysis. This report, nice results in terms of progression-free survival. If we, you compare the results to uh, uh, those with chemotherapy, it could be interesting to look at the fact that for the first time, we have new compound, we are not chemotherapy, able to be efficient in ovarian cancer. The last one, there is just uh, a phase two with 50 patients, all report BRCA mutation, and they also report nice results in terms of median uh, progression-free survival. The response rate is 26%, but all the patients receive more than three lines of treatment before, so it's quite nice, and all were um, a BRCA mutated tumor. So if we want to summarize, we can see that in all the POP inhibitor, we observe activity in uh, using the treatment in monotherapy, in upfront or in maintenance, and the response rate is quite similar between the drug. We also report a better response rate, a better effect in BRCA mutated tumor, but not only in BRCA mutated, and we also show a better effect in sensitive population compared to resistant population that can be an issue to decide to introduce the treatment. It's a, a, an answer to Mansour. In terms of safety profile, it is quite difficult to compare because all of this um, POP were uh, explored in different populations of patients, some in maintenance after chemo, some upfront. So please do not look more in, de in detail the, the, the comparison, but I just want to report that the uh, safety profile is not exactly the same. For example, we can see a little bit more asthenia looking to rubicaparib, more diarrhea looking to uh, olaparib or veliparib, more hepatic toxicity can be also an issue, and this will be at the end probably something interesting when we would like to select one of these compounds in for, for our patients. Now, how to introduce this different option in the management of ovarian cancer? Nereke report you the story of an ovarian cancer patient from the beginning to the end. As, as you can see, it is a succession of relapse with a different uh, pro, um, platinum free interval and over the time, we observe a resistance to platinum. We can choose to treat the patient up front or in maintenance therapy to consolidate the effect of the chemotherapy. It also can be a choice we have to discuss with the patient, for example. And if we want to introduce the compound available today, all of these, olaparib or rucaparib, are dedicated to BRCA mutated patients, unfortunately. But we can use it as a maintenance treatment or upfront if you don't want to decrease the quality of life of the patient, but Yalid will speak more in detail about that. And perhaps in the near future, we can also introduce Niraparib. But now for PAP, what is our most important question? For me, is to define the best population. As you can see on the previous slide, probably BRCA mutated germline or somatic is clearly one of the most important and most interesting population. But also, HRD seems very nice, and Keta will report more in detail. Concerning HRD negative, I think we need to have more data to consolidate the NOVA trial, but it seems to be really interesting. My point is now to focus on homologous recombination deficiency, how to define this population of patients. Another question will be future combination, but we, we will back after. Homologous recombination deficiency. It's something quite easy to understand. 
it's something induced by genetic mutation, methylation, but also a lot of unknown mechanisms. And don't worry, nobody knows. But we know that at the end, in cancer cell, this deficiency in homologous recombination induce a genetic uh, instability. And when we go back to the literature, and when we look at the instability, the genetic instability, we see something really interesting, in fact. Pennington report in more than 400 can ovarian cancer, she looks at the BRCA mutation, but also she looks at all the genes involved in homologous recombination, and she looks at the results of this analysis. And what she reports, she reports that finally, Homologous recombination deficiency um, increased the survival of the patient with ovarian cancer compared to patients who did not have homologous recombination deficiency. Why? Because they increase the sensitivity to the drug. And so the good pronostic will be really interesting. And the second important information in this paper is that we finally report quite similar overall survival and progression-free survival for patients who have BRCA mutation, but also for patients who have um, abnormality in, in homologous recombination gene, not BRCA, uh, BRCA gene. So it's a good point, and we can consider that this could be uh, really interesting for to explain sensitivity to PARP and to use PARP in this situation. And more in, in general, the tumor with HRD share, sharing the same common phenotype will push us to define a, a clear test to identify this patient. So how to identify a tumor with uh, homologous recombination deficiency? We have finally two, today, perhaps uh, it will be different in the future, two way to pathway to explore. Panel, next generation sequencing of all genes involved in the homologous recombination, or genomic scar exploring like a signature correlated to homologous recombination. I will try to explain as I can. When we look to the molecular classification of uh, high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, you can see that, of course, in the field of homologous recombination pathway, we identify BRCA1, BRCA2 as the major gene, but also a, um, a long list of, on other genes um, involved in this recombination repair. And so the first idea is to look at all the gene to look at the mutation, inactivation, deletion, and to consider that if a tumor reports some abnormality, it can be interesting to receive POP uh, inhibitor. It is that it was done by um, uh, people uh, from the study 19. They explore all the genes of the uh, homologous recombination, look at any abnormality, and they look in the population receiving olaparib versus placebo if there is something interesting. And they observe that effectively. They increase the effect of olaparib in all the tumors where we observe an abnormality in gene involved in the uh, homologous recombination. But it is something very uh, difficult. We have to look at each gene after one. And the second point is coming from the Rukaparib paper. When they look at all the effects for each gene, we can see that the response is not exactly the same in front of the different gene. Why? We, we don't know exactly. Perhaps it's just because the abnormality is not at the right place, but it seems something very difficult to um, organize in routine practice. So another possibility is to move to signature. I will try to explain you the foundation medicine signature. They look at the... Uh, um, loss of heterogeneity. Loss of heterogeneity is uh, um, induced by homologous recombination deficiency. And this loss of heterogeneity can be analyzed and can be able to report uh, this uh, homologous recombination deficiency. So they move to the TCGA data. They look at the LOH. They consider the survival, the retrospective analysis, and they define a cutoff where they consider, finally, I don't know if I can put here, they look at the odd ratio, significativity, 
looking at the overall survival, and they consider that 14% will be probably the best cutoff to explain, to find the level where LOH could be sufficient to report any benefit using PARP inhibitor. This is correlated to overall survival. And effectively, when you look at the CGH analysis, we have a quite similar phenotype done in the group where they observe BRCA mutation. Looking at this analysis, they decide to explore the effect in the IL2 trial, and of course, they report a response rate clearly better in the LOHA high um, score compared to LOH low, 29% of response rate compared to 10%. And this test could be a good test, will be explored in the IL3 trial prospectively, and finally will be possibly validated if they confirm that it is a good test to identify the, 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 the right patient. Another solution, a little bit more complex, is coming from my choice. Uh, I know that Keta will report about this test, but you have to, to understand that it is a compilation of several genomic an, uh, um, anomaly. They uh, explore the loss of heterogeneity, a single allele anomaly, telomeric allelic imbalance. It is a difference between the 1-1 ratio of the maternal and paternal uh, allele, uh, specifically in the region of your telomere. And the large-scale state transition is uh, a difference between two different adjacent regions in the same chromosome. All of these abnormality combined to the BRCA mutation can be reported a test able to identify the uh, tumor with uh, NASHRD able to be the best candidate for PARP inhibitor. What well, it is exactly done in the NOVA trial and will be explained by Keta after. One point when we are using a test is what we want with this test. We want to identify all the patients where we can find any benefit or we want to explore only patients where the benefit will be the best. And something very different for us, probably uh, we do not have exactly the same feeling. I don't know, Monso perhaps want to identify 90% of the patients where we have a, be a best uh, progression-free survival or just three months. Keta will just be sure to give the, the treatment for patients where the median PFS will be 12 months and because you want to avoid any side effects and something really difficult for us not to have a test black or, or white test. The other point is when we look at the uh, analysis of these different tests I reported before in the population where they are explored, we can see it is not a comparison again because it's not the same population in not the same method. But we can see that finally these different tests can be able to um, select, identify not exactly the same population. Probably the STD19 test using a panel of genes involved in the homologous recombination deficiency are not looking at the same population than the other. And so the odd ratio will be for, uh, automatically different. And it is something really important. And in our community today, we don't know what is the best standard to uh, select the patient. So if I want to conclude about PARP and about test to identify the best population, finally, I can give any conclusion. We are different PARP. There are different patient population. Efficacy and toxicity profile are not exactly the same. And we, we have to incorporate it when we decide to use one of them. In terms of uh, uh, tests to identify the best population of patients who can receive PARP, today we don't know exactly what is the best test. And Deciding to treat all the patients in response to platin could be an interesting option today. I agree with Mansour. In terms of future direction, what we want to explore is not only PARP alone, it's also the combination, and I mentioned before, um, Paula 1 study is in, in first life. 
because if this drug is efficient in relapse, I will be happy to cure and to treat more patients in first line and also in combination with BEV because we know that there is some uh, argument to consider synergy between antiangiogenic and POP. And also the other important issue is to understand the immune uh, uh, treatment in combination with POP because we know that BRCA mutated tumor have um, highest level of PDL1 expression is that that way? And the use of POP inhibitor induce an increased level of uh, uh, CD8 and NK cell within the tumor uh, environment able to increase the effect of immune treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So um, if um, it is okay that we can take uh, Kate's talk yeah? and then take the discussion together.